Hey everyone, I'm super excited to be publishing our latest podcast with Dimitri Khan. We're discussing some of his latest works around his keynote talk at the Haystack European Conference and this latest blog post on neural search frameworks, a head-to-head comparison. So I think it would help a lot to see uh, the visual that Dimitri's created to describe the neural search uh, pyramid. So you see from this visual of the uh, the pyramid going from the approximate nearest neighbor algorithms to the vector databases, neural frameworks, encoders, and application business logic and user interface. So a big part of this podcast is going to be Dimitri and I debating these components, uh, you know, where, what should go where, and then sort of the abstractions around it. But hopefully this visual helps a lot with um, what we're going to discuss in the podcast. I also thought this would be the perfect podcast to debut the WeVA podcast search app, searching through the WeVA podcast with WeVA, of course. So here's the GitHub repository with the WeVA podcast search. All you would need to do is clone this repository, then run docker compose up D and then Python three restore.py to restore the backup with the full transcript with this podcast with Dimitri in it. Uh, so I'm really curious what people think about these two lines of code for restoring data sets, because this is kind of the thinking so far around uh, how we're planning to package up the beer data sets. So if you test this out, please let us know how you think about this experience. And I really hope you enjoy uh, searching through the podcast. So once you're running the podcast search app in Weaviate, you can ask it all sorts of questions like what is the neural search pyramid? And it will semantically match it with the part of the conversation that talks about it and all sorts of other topics that were mentioned in the podcast. So maybe if you don't have time to listen to the entire hour and 45 minute podcast, you can just search through it with the Weaviate podcast search app. So thanks so much uh, for checking this out. And I really hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for checking out the WeVA podcast. I'm beyond excited for this episode. We have Dimitri Khan, one of the most influential speakers in search technology. Uh, Dimitri is the host of the Vector podcast. He's a senior product manager at TomTom, and he's recently given this incredible keynote at uh, the Haystack European Conference 2022. Uh, So firstly, Dimitri, thank you so much for joining the WeVA podcast. Hey, Connor. Thanks for having me. It's always, it was always a pleasure to talk to you. Awesome. So could we maybe kick things off with uh, the big, the keynote, where vector search is uh, taking us and some of the key ideas behind that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the keynote, I had an honor to give this keynote at the Haystack conference, as you mentioned, in Berlin in uh, late September last year. And uh, there have been a bunch of uh, actually people from vector search community, including VV8 and uh, Pinecone and Quadrant and uh, also users. This was especially interesting to see how far ahead users gotten and they they've been asking very precise questions you know like how do i choose a model and and Hmm. which database to prefer and so on and so forth this was very interesting and some of them have been already trying things and so in that sense i wouldn't say like a year ago maybe i felt like i could um share more and educate more and even explain the basics uh nowadays it's more like okay we already we already understand the basics okay can you explain what 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 practical step I can take to actually implement vector search? Or I have tried, you know, doc to query. It doesn't work that mm. well. What should I do? You know, and uh, one of the key points in the um, in the keynote uh, key points in the keynote <laughs> I have uh, had was uh, this um, work that was done by McKinsey and, and, and Google in 2021, so almost like two years ago now, uh, where they call out the issue of search abandonment costs in uh, for the U.S. retailers. So it's only U.S. Hmm. retail, um, which kind of like loses $300 billion a year. Uh, hmm. And and why they do this, why, why this happens is because of the search abandonment issue. So, you know, practically speaking, users start typing a you know a query they probably see some autocomplete some some dynamics going on on the website then they check the results and they cannot find what they look for and we discussed with you in, in the vector podcast uh, just recently um that the query language the the user language is so different right mm. uh, user to user um mm. I have a bunch of examples on this front as well when 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 search and e-commerce doesn't work. Um, and so what's interesting also is that um, 64%, 64% of uh, retail website managers do not have a clear plan for improvement. So they kind of lose the money. They don't know what to do with it, how to fix this. And that's like more than half of them, right? It's like a big, big number. Um, and another issue that kind of surfaces 
now that I have this product management hat on, um, it's interesting to see that 85% of global online consumers view a brand completely differently after the search is unsuccessful. Mm. So in some sense, the brands themselves have nothing to do with the search engine, which is basically like, let's say an aggregator or whatever, like Amazon <laughs> type of thing, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. But like if search doesn't work there, they think it's brand's problem because they cannot find the item they are looking for, right? And so mm-hmm. they change the perception of the brand. This is how important it is to make the search uh, work. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's super fascinating. Is It reminds me maybe like these kind of numbers is something about like, maybe 98% of data is private and the motivation of sort of indexing and searching through private data. And as, as well as this retail thing, like having these kind of numbers, but um, I'm kind of thinking like, so with the retail and fixing it, is it the responsibility of the brands? Like whose responsibility is it to implement these, the cutting edge search engines? I mean, you know, we think like with the VVA, it's our responsibility to build it and make it available. And do you see it as being like more, uh, more independent, uh, e-commerce retail stores. So like not just Amazon, you know, being sort of the front layer, but more and more, uh, individual retail sites taking on, uh, you know, this pipeline of, as we'll talk about neural search frameworks, like having their own, uh, Weavia, Gina AI kind of setup. Yeah. I think that's, that's an excellent question. And I think it kind of like depends on the situation, the practical situation with engineering and, and, and sort of, um, um, assets and resources that this company has, and also like the focus that they want to have, right? In some mm-hmm. cases, companies might want to like outsource this and just ask somebody to build it for them. Mm-hmm. And and this is this is an interesting opportunity, you know, for um, players like, for example, Semi or or Vespa. You know, if if you guys have a cloud offering which is kind of like end to end you know, solving a particular issue, you know, starting from actually creating the embeddings, all the weight, all these backups, every infra element is taken care of. And then on top of this, you can actually prove that, you know, I can actually retrieve the, the, um, the items with, with higher relevancy than I would do myself, because what, what does it mean for me to make it myself? I would mm-hmm. start like scrambling, reading Stack Overflow, hiring engineers, and that's like a long path, right? And uh, mm-hmm. maybe I'd rather pay money and just get to the market sooner. And so I think uh, that's an excellent question. But there is another facet to this, um, I guess. Is it like in your question, is it brand's um, concern or is it like, uh, uh, a, let's say, a neural search framework or vector database concern or is it like a retailer concern? In, in some sense, I think it's like a, it's a joint ecosystem, right? It's not like you can just say, Hey, please fix me the house and, and I'll pay you, but they might fix it their own way. They might also break some things while they do this, but you are paying. So money don't always buy everything. So I I think I still believe that it's better if these players would collaborate in some ways, for example, you know, if we're talking, talking about neural search implementation, you know, what's important is like, for example, how you catalog an item, what mm-hmm. metadata you have, right? And so, and also how up to date it is, right? So somebody needs to be supplying this data to you. And so maybe the brands could be supplying this data to you as they change or introduce new products. Um, but then everything else, you know, the pipeline should be already in place uh, and it should be easy to use, you know, be it an API or some other way. Like Amazon, I remember they they have an office, they have a service of delivering data on trucks, right? <laughs> because it's much mm-hmm. faster to deliver on trucks than <laughs> to upload it because it's a lot of data. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's like a medium sized store, like maybe you don't need a truck to deliver your data, you know, on a batch <laughs> level or whatever, like you could build an API. Um, I hope I answer, I answer your question, but there's another, another perspective also to keep in mind, even if you have the engineering force in play, like in house, um, building, uh, like if you take like an open source database or open source neural framework, it might take you a while to, to gain the, you know, to, to, to accumulate the knowledge, to gain the momentum, to realize, okay, this is what we can build from POC to actually productizing this. 
um, maybe it's easier if you just go and kind of like outsource this resource, this cost to a managed database, like in case of Viviate, in case of Pinecone, um, and focus on something else, right? Focus on that specific, you know, cataloging issue, or maybe bringing a classifier that will do the product classification on the fly and things like that, right? So it's kind of like put your effort and focus on what matters. And then later, maybe you can change your mind. You know, the moment you grow, maybe you will decide to build your own vector database. <laughs> but but before you before that happened, you need to kind of like pay your bills, right? And so don't don't get ahead of yourself. And also, if you partner with a clever, you know, player, which is like we have a lot of them now in the market, um, you know, you might win, and they will also learn. You will learn together. So I think that that that's an interesting perspective to, to also think about. Yeah, it's a it's a brilliant way to open up this as, as we're also talking about neural search frameworks. And you've written this great blog post that outlines the different neural search frameworks. And as you mentioned, I mean, it's just a, you did a brilliant job just covering it. And this idea of, uh, you know, the overhead for learning it, the learning curve is something being something that's important. And at Weaviate, there's a huge focus on uh, UX and being developer friendly, creating content to try to educate, especially with the new releases, we try to have even our Weaviate Air show to, you know, try to explain how to use all the stuff and what it is as much as possible. And I think this is going to be such an interesting discussion because it's there. There are parts of it that are that should live outside of Weaviate. I think parts that I think maybe should be built into Weaviate. And I also want to just quickly set this up before we get into it that like. Th this what I say on the podcast about the relationship of Weaviate and neural search frameworks is my personal opinion. It's not like an official statement of Weaviate with respect to like how I see what should be built where. Uh, so I really want to kind of transition this into maybe uh, we could kind of do the tour of the neural search framework, starting off by maybe just the high level of how are you currently defining a neural search framework? Oh yeah, that's that's an, an excellent question, and 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 maybe I can also intro like I created this um, you know mental diagram for myself, and I kept selling it everywhere, and it seems like people get it, and some of them even like reach out on LinkedIn and say, hey, I got your vector search pyramid, thank you for creating it, but really I. You know, my goal was just to put things in their place, like on a bookshelf, so you can like reach out and 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 give context and 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 ground your discussion. And so, in this vector search pyramid, which we probably can also share, you know, essentially, like on the base on the base level, you have the KNN and ANN algorithms, and to some extent, I also covered some of them, not all of them. You know, I know that Pinecone, for example, did a great job publishing uh, a lot of material on this, you know, how each algorithm works. We also happen to invent one algorithm, BuddyPQ, um, which is just a modification of product quantization. Um, and then the next, the next layer, and I did publish a year ago now, uh, a blog about not all vector databases are made equal. And so you have Milbus, VV8, Pinecone, you know, GSI, Quadrant, Vespa, Vald, <laughs> and also those players that kind of like, yeah, I, I, I didn't find yet the, the proper phrase. I, I kind of say catch up, but on the other hand, it's not like catch up. It's like being involved and actually going into this space uh, for existing databases like uh, Redis and Elasticsearch and Solar, and they add vector search functionality as well for their users. Um, and then there was this next layer that I couldn't like quite wrap my head around, and I was thinking, what exactly is this? And of course, Genome and Haystack are sort of like, in some sense, the pioneers of, of creating the terminology. And so I think at some point they were calling themselves neural search frameworks. Um, recently, I saw that Gina is calling themselves something like MLOps for neural search. So, so of course these things morph, but, but I kind of like decided to stay with the same term, like neural search framework. And uh, I kind of labeled every system I could come across. Uh, but there are some exceptions as well, by the way, there, and I'll get there. Uh, but basically, the way I define it, and I guess we can share the, the blog post itself, is that basically reading from the blog, Neural Search Framework is an end-to-end -end software layer 
that allows you to create a neural search experience, including data processing, model serving, and scaling capabilities in the production setting. So like, just to unpack this, so let's say if you take a um, SQL database and you want to build a website, right? Um, you will still need to figure out, okay, where do you get the data? How do you process it before it gets in the SQL database? Then how do you normalize the tables if you do that, right? Like foreign keys and all this thing, how, which index type to choose and things like that. So, so that it actually breathes and works and, and can scale. Um, but like this definition may sound to some people as uh, MLOps, machine learning operations. But there is a key difference that, first of all, MLOps, the, the, it's like a wide area. It's it's a wide field. You know, it, it, it concerns itself with a lot of things like, I don't know, model training, you know, model versioning, deployment, serving, monitoring, you know, data drift, fine tuning, a lot of, a lot of things, right? And, and, and the application is also quite diverse. Like, I don't know, I could be building, um, I don't know, face recognition system or something like that, right? So, uh, but like neural search framework focuses only on neural search. So it's like, and, and, and also another question that frequently comes up is like, what's the difference between neural search and, and vector search? In a way, there is no difference. It's just like how you take which angle, let's say neural search, you could think of it, okay, I have a deep learning network. And so that's probably why it's neural because it's like <laughs> deep learning, uh, you know, neural network. Um, but if you take the stance of, let's say, um, geometric space, right? So you, you embed your object into a multidimensional geometric space. And now you need to, and each, each point is a vector. So now you need to basically find a vector which is relevant for your query vector. So you are doing a vector search, right? But but this is kind of like mechanics of it. Um, so yeah, I think this is how I define it. Yeah, and I think I'd, I'd want to start with connecting with our earlier conversation of the lost money in retail and uh, more and more brand stores trying to build their own retails. And I'd even maybe extend that to people with their own blogs, looking to have searchable things on their blogs and, you know, also paying the bills and not worrying about this thing. I kind of want to start off with, say, like the uh, data pre-processing layer. Like I, I see kind of with these neural search frameworks, they define these pipelines. And, and I think pipelines is sort of the key uh, term here. And, I, and I'm going to talk about what I what the pipeline I think should live in Weaviate and what I think should live outside of Weaviate. And I think maybe starting off with just like the data ingestion part, like maybe you have some kind of API that you query to get the data. You have maybe like a PDF parser with some kind of OCR. Uh, how are you thinking about that first part of the data ingestion layer? Because and maybe if I could just add one more thing to transition the question when, when and coming into like running things in production, uh, Gina AI, they have these executor pattern. And, you know, I learned a lot about this on the Weaviate podcast with Maximilian work. I highly recommend that if you're curious about learning more about this pattern for listeners, but this kind of way of scheduling like a cron job that say, you know, every two hours it's going to query this API, like, or say every day it's going to hit the archive API to get the new batch of machine learning papers, parse out the text and chunk it in the PDF, then vectorize those chunks and, and then maybe put that to weave in. And then yeah, I don't want to, let's start just on that first part of. Yeah. yeah I think it's, it's another excellent you know, topic to think about because um, I've been consulting a few startups that are trying to build vector search, right? And uh, they sort of get quickly f far ahead, you know, because they have, let's say, a database, a vector database. They have um, their data, obviously. They've chosen a model to vectorize with. Um, they're already scratching the relevancy side of things, but but then someone comes in and says, hey, we just received another batch of uh, objects. We have half, half a million, you know, <laughs> objects to, to index. Can you please index them? And, and by the way, I have a demo tomorrow, right? <laughs> so, so what options do you have, right? And, and, and literally some of the developers which would reach out to me and say, hey, any, any options, anything to save this uh, situation? And, you know, like, of course, um, naively, what you can do is that you can start writing a Python or Java, you know, concurrent app, which will 
start unpacking this, you know, data sets, <laughs> you know, reading from a three or something like that. Uh, and then vectorizing, you hear the problem that, oh, you need to use GPU to speed things up and uh, that's quite costly. So we mm -hmm. need to kind of like pre-think a lot of things and not make a mistake if we launch this um, in batch mode and it will run for two weeks. So you go back to your manager and say, it's going to take two weeks. And they're like, what? And how much is it? $5,000. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so like each time we crawl the data, mm -hmm. you're going to need $5,000 in two weeks. It's like going out of hand, right? And mm -hmm. so, um, especially what you what you mentioned in Gina, and also there is a framework called TXT AI, which I mm -hmm. learned just you know by kind of like googling inside GitHub, if I can say that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they have this notion of um, kind of this workflow. So, for example, as you said in Gina, you can do. Um, you, you, you can have an executor that will uh, read uh, kind of like an archive and, and, and basically iterate PDF files and then transform or parse the, the textual content out of a PDF file. And then it proceeds to the next stage, right? Um, and and TXT AI, for example, also has, you know, some connectors for other types of data like uh, in computer vision space or um, automatic speech recognition space mm -hmm. um, and so they have different like workflows that will help you set things up really quickly they have one demo app um, on hugging face spaces uh, mm -hmm. which essentially what it does is that it goes to hacker news front page it scrapes you know the top links um, and then it indexes the titles you know of mm -hmm. That, that top page, the top on, on that front page. And then it show, shows a search box. So it basically indexes all these titles, you know, embeds them uh, on the fly. Um, and, and, and then basically when it's ready, you have the search box appearing on the screen and now you're ready to query it. Mm -hmm. And so it is that easy and they show, you know, how easy it is. Of course, it's not what you will use in production setting, most likely. You know, mm -hmm. like in production, you want to have like a workflow that routinely goes and checks that front page, you know, like a cron tab, and then indexes that. And you still have the the index that is serving the queries. So you have some offline index, which is being prepared, mm -hmm. and then you do the swap, you know, and things like that. But they also simplify things like, deploying on Kubernetes so you can scale things up. Because like literally, if you if you write your own Python app, and, and one of the startups, by the way, there was a, a bottleneck uh, specifically in this component that would read the objects um, one by one, and then mm -hmm. it would try to classify the object and then embed it, and then it proceeds to the next uh, step. And it was like, I think it was like single thread application which would kind of like take forever and it was very convoluted, right? Because if you don't have the framework in your hands, you start reinventing the wheel. And mm -hmm. so most likely you will kind of um, cut the corners and uh, you will be basically wasting time unless mm -hmm. you have a lot of time, which usually is not the case in startups. Like you need to build something really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is, this is something that I think is probably um you know ha hasn't been in the minds um of the makers um, maybe like more the, than a year ago but i think it becomes more and more important that you don't just bring the vector search core functionality you don't just sell the statement that hey move to neural search and all your problems will be solved, but you can actually show the path to get there, right? And with these mm -hmm. workflows that process the data, access the data quickly um, and allow you to do this repeatedly uh, is going to win more customers. Yeah, and I think, um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if maybe I'm slowing it down too much, but I, I think maybe from the next step of we've gotten the data and now we're vectorizing it, I kind of want to, if we could talk a little more about the decisions with vectorizing the data. I think it's so interesting. You, you mentioned like a single thread approach where you're, you're not taking advantage of like batching on the GPU or parallelization on the CPUs. And uh, we've recently added things like Onyx support for the text to vec, um, and thanks to March and Antis who, who got this done. And like this kind of 
model inference for the vectorization sake. Also, I mentioned on the Vector podcast that I'm really excited about our partnership with Neural Magic and what they're doing to uh, sparsify these models so they can run super fast on CPUs. And so, I'm, I'm, and maybe one more reference is in our Weave podcast with Sam Bean from U.com. He describes how they combine uh, the Spark big data technology with the Onyx acceleration for the CPUs and how they vectorize that way. I know you've done a podcast uh, with Max from Mighty. Uh, can you tell me how you're thinking about the vectorization layer? Sorry, one more thing is <laughs> with Weave 8, I think kind of another interesting thing about this is how we have separate Docker containers for Weave 8, as well as these deep learning model inference containers. So you can kind of um, scale them up differently with, I think, things like the Kubernetes Helm chart. And it's a little more complicated, but <laughs> like you can scale them up different. Or you could just use the Weave 8 cloud service if, you know, as you say, you want to pay your bills some other way. So uh, can, you, can you tell me about how you're thinking about the vectorization space? Yeah, for sure. And I think, um... So I think it's kind of like it's 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 great when you describe how you guys build it. Uh, I I I take the stance like of looking at it as an outsider, and in some cases I'm basically the um, the middle level between you know the, the the customer and and then sort of participating in the decision making, and mm -hmm. I'm not fully aware of how things are implemented inside the vector database, for example, but I know that somebody's got to pay the bill in the end, right? <laughs> even if even if you use a um, vector, uh, sorry, a, a cloud solution, still the bill will come your way, right? And um, guess what? It's either you or your manager that will have to pay it. <laughs> and, um, and also, guess what? Uh, because of the low mar margins, and I just had a podcast uh, with the uh, GSI um, product manager, uh, where he says that uh, uh, you know a lot of these things are now on the radars of even big players like Amazon uh, or any any big player that you think is a big player, they st still might have very low margin. Like Google might have very low margin on their web search, right? So mm -hmm. it's very important for them to optimize things, and so I think. This article in the budget, if I can say so, is very important as you build the um, um, the neural search experience. Um, and so, if you need to pay, like as, as I was saying, five thousand uh, dollars, you know, each time, uh, it's going to be prohibitively high, and so it will slow you down, right? Like eventually, you will say, "Hey, maybe we don't evolve." you know, as frequently, maybe we will just do it once a half a year and it may also die out. So it's kind of like important to address this heads on. And in one of the startups, I actually re recommended Max's work. And so I said, hey, let's um, port them. Can you port the model to, to Onyx and um, <clears throat> basically make it available as part of Mighty? And what Mighty does is that it basically moves your computation from GPU to CPU at a co comparable, um, so the quality is exactly the same, you know, get the same embeddings, but you pay less, right? And the speed of doing this on CPU is comparable as well as, as it mm -hmm. would be on GPU. So in that sense, maybe you can dedicate GPU cluster more to things like model fine tuning where it matters, but to, uh, but to that production side of things, like when you compute the embeddings already on the existing model, and then how you productize, how you serve things. You don't need GPUs necessarily. Maybe in some uh, edge cases you do, uh, but then you know, like, okay, why we do this? Probably it pays the, the bill and also brings something on top. So it makes sense to, to do this, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think this is, this is interesting that I've also learned in the past year that um, you know how things kind of get created, right? So first you get that hype of new tech, like a you know, big data a few years ago. And then comes this realization that, oh yeah, yeah, we do have a lot of data. Oh, sounds mm -hmm. like Hadoop is the, the way to go. But then all this data shuffling, or oh, how do I upload the data in, <laughs> into HDFS? Like, you know, and all these connectors arise mm -hmm. and like oh, all of these things. And then somebody comes over and says, hey, no, no Hadoop anymore. Like, let's do something else. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but, but, but I think every step in this, in this journey is important. You know, if there was no hypers, so to say, in the beginning saying like, 
you know, like Bob uh, Van Lloyd was saying, I was just in the airport of the conference with Google <laughs> and I realized, hey, there's something here, you know, let me build this mm -hmm. model and maybe it, it can reason semantically about text. Uh, mm -hmm. And even if, even if it wasn't doing 100% perfectly, it was already showing the, the way to move forward, right? Mm -hmm. But then all these other items, which are more like mundane, infrastructure level, unsexy, no one talks about them on sales presentations. So like mm -hmm. product level, maybe even, right? So you mm -hmm. don't say this to users, hey, you know what? I spent $5,000 to embed the items and now you can find them. <laughs> you don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's usually DevOps people. It's usually, you know, heads of units that will say, hey, did we spend $5,000 again? Can you do something about it? Um, <laughs> so then you go back and say, oh, which options do I have? And so I think then it becomes important to focus more and more. And I think Max, by the way, gave a, an excellent presentation and he showed also how he scales. So it, it's not just mm -hmm. a Docker image of Mighty that, you know, you can send a, an object and get an embedding, but he also shows how to scale it out and, and basically still mm -hmm. save on 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 money and 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 um, make it efficient in terms of time so it, it becomes like a trade-off of how soon you need it how much money you have you know how much money you can burn on this and things like that but basically he's he's working on a very efficient implementation so i can recommend that yeah it's so interesting i think like you could completely abstracted by sending the embeddings to the open AI embeddings API or coheres embeddings API. And there's like that model as a service model on the cloud API thing, or there are these, you know, do it yourself options. And I think one thing that I think the frameworks contribute a lot is with the ease of like Docker array embed or, you know, the deep set cloud with Haystack and how you can just have your Python code to embed and then put it in the database layer. So I think I'm skipping over a little bit over that little layer of you have the vectors and now you need to import them into Weave8. Because I think, um, you know, and I, we we have like a new Python client and uh, Dirk Kulwayek is the expert on this and hopefully he'll be back on the podcast. He was on our 1.15 release podcast. We can talk about that. But uh, passing that import layer, let's talk about um, the ANN index part. And um, I'm curious, like, how you see the entanglement between the ANN index and the database part? Like, is there a chance that it could be separated? I know with Weave8, like the, you know, HNSW product quantization, it's, it's written in Golang. It's very like in the core of Weave8. Do you think these two things could be separate layers of the pyramid one day? Yeah, that's also a great question. Uh, and, and the podcast that I mentioned with Yanni Vaknin from, from GSI is one example where the and an index can become its own entity um, because GSI is basically GSI offers a an APU component, right? So associative processing unit. So mm -hmm. think of it as the same um, you know system in in the family of uh, processing units like CPU, GPU, and it's kind of like next uh, stage in a way um, targeted specifically at. Um, uh, neural search, but not only that. Uh, and, and so in principle, uh, VV8 or like Quadrant or Pinecomb, what have you, or Elasticsearch could be basically that computation layer. So in some sense, it's like a middle layer which receives the data. It knows where the data is. It knows everything about relations between objects and so on, but it doesn't need to uh, so like on, on certain scale, it could also do the vector search for you, right? And so for example, using quite efficient HNSW algorithm or uh, product quantization or something like that. Um, and I know that you guys also implemented DSKNN, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So like, uh, I mean, so this is when companies will concern with themselves with the cost issue and they say, hey, um, for our use case, it seems like, you know, RAM is way too expensive. Can we actually move closer to the disk? And we have plenty of SSDs, they're cheaper. Uh, and this KNN, which I think is kind of like a, a, a derivative from Zoom paper, essentially mm -hmm. basically moves closer to the disk. It, it does that expensive uh, sorting of uh, full precision vectors as the last step, but everything uh, before that happens uh, on other layers, like uh, with lower granularity of vectors. And they also solve the problem in HNSW 
um and again <laughs> sorry Yuri Malkov but like he might he might he might disagree for sure but like uh in that paper they claim in in this in and paper they claim that thousand nodes in the HNSW graph that they have built were unreachable from any point mm. uh from any entry point and so they have they have fixed this problem so they increase the connectivity of the graph um and so you know these fundamental issues um uh, uh, being solved and you can then focus on things like okay how do i quantize my vectors uh to what extent and this again is a trade-off between granularity and and sort of like um later issues that you, you will have right so for example with uh precision and vectors overlapping uh to the single point so you need to disambiguate them in some way and there are ways to do this but it's also may become expensive in some cases um so so this is interesting that i think uh and this was also one of the questions on my keynote as well is there a place for hardware um, companies and maybe startups even uh, to appear on this scene um, of course we know that nvidia and intel are working on this they've been competing heads-on on billion scale uh, and then competition challenge uh, last year, uh, but also, of course, GSI does it. And I think, yes, of course, building a hardware startup today may, may sound scary, but um, at the same time, I think this could be very interesting to, to tap into. And so maybe in the future, already today, you know, like uh, there is a um, connector between Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, and uh, GSI hardware. So basically, the way I think about it is that uh, in Elasticsearch, you can compute facets, right? So you can build, I don't know, nightly job that builds facets and then displays them in some dashboard or sends them to the users. Uh, uh, so all of this computation could happen in Elasticsearch, but that other expensive uh, computation with neural search could happen outside. So you don't need to kind of like suffer from the fact that now you need to balance between these two ex fairly expensive um, processes at scale uh, but you could kind of like uh, uh, distribute them you know how we do with mm -hmm. vacuum cleaners we charge them <laughs> and then they go around the house and clean right so they don't use the electricity and you can use the electricity for some other purpose so mm -hmm. exactly the same idea I think may may kind of like enter the scene uh, at some point hmm. so I, I, really I thought I've just so many things as you're talking so packed with knowledge i think um well i really want to kind of understand the apu a little more because i don't quite get, understand i think i think i want to quickly touch on some other things and then we can come back to that um so i think a very interesting thing is about the incremental nature of the a and index in database entanglement the the key distinction between like vector database and vector library amongst other things in my opinion is that you have to incrementally update the vector index compared to like build once and then you have the static index search. And I think that's, I think HNSW is amenable to that, but like product quantization, making it like online, uh, cause what product quantization is, is you have the vectors and you're clustering them for each of the dimensions to reduce the precision by representing say 32 bits with instead the centroid ID of that index in the vector. And then you can like couple it and slide it that way to like, have the k-means and i know that you understand that i'm just kind of saying that for the listeners <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> but so the kind of incremental thing is how i see that distinction but um but yeah could we come back to the hardware and what makes it different i know that like sarah bros is building this big chip with the thing of you know we're you know like gpt3 is limited i think i think 4096 is the token limit at the time of this and i know it's i was recently reading deep mind sparrow paper and it's fascinating to see these massive prompts. Like when you see a prompt that's like, you know, a 1200 token prompt, you're like, wow, that's quite a prompt. Mm -hmm. Like this idea of building custom hardware to overcome the quadratic attention. Or I know there's like sparse attention, but, but like generally to have massive inputs to transformers. So, so that's kind of my frame of reference for understanding custom hardware for deep learning. And I think the TPUs are a similar idea where it's like a big GPU. So what are the details behind the APU? How is it optimized for vectorization? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we can um, share a couple of links on that. Uh, we've also happened to build a demo, um, which we presented at uh, Berlin Buzzwords last year. So we took um, 
you know, 10 million images and um, <clears throat> from Leon data set. And uh, we have used clip model to uh, vectorize them and then build a demo where you can compare how, um, you know, in image vector search compares to, let's say, uh, in title vector search uh, versus complete keyword uh, approach, right? So no vectors involved. And so we've used APU as our backend, uh, you know, far backend uh, for storing these vectors and actually, uh, you know, computing uh, the nearest neighbor set. And so basically the way uh, APU looks all sort of like on the inside is that, uh, first of all, it's, it's kind of like this paradigm of compute and memory. So if you take kind of like a traditional server in a way traditional um, where you have a CPU and RAM, um, when you will run the, uh, let's say HNSW algorithm or some other algorithm, whatever, um, it will have to kind of like go back and forth between memory and CPU, right? Because like mm -hmm. some things are in memory that you keep as a state, but then in CPU, you still need to do the computation, right? And so you, you basically constantly like change the, uh, the context. And so, um, you kind of lose some time, uh, in doing that, uh, in, in the APU, they, they pushed as far ahead as possible to go after a massive computation. Like basically, um, they do it entirely in memory. So they don't involve, um, any CPU or any other U <laughs> units, right? <laughs> so, um, and 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 so they have like 48 million um ram cells so it's highly packed maybe we can provide an image you know like mm -hmm. uh, uh, one one chip that you can insert into the server and i think you can insert a couple of these to you should insert a couple of these to um scale to 1 billion items right and if you have less you can insert maybe one um uh, and so, so basically, each of these units uh, contains like forty-eight million um, RAM cells, and then, mm -hmm. and then they have like, so they roll roll up to like units that basically do the programmatic bit logic computation. And uh, in principle, if you um, if you quantize the vectors to the bit level then basically you are, what you need to do is kind of like bit, bit logic, right? So like bit mm. computation, like multiplications or what have you, um, as you do the vector search. And so basically like you can send, um, let's say 20 queries at, at one single time. Uh, and you might have 1 billion items to check against and they can massively basically run this parallel computation for all 20 queries at, at the same time. So you will have to pre-compute the uh, vector representation for your vectors, but beyond that, they will do the, this math, massive computation and then they will return you results for each of these um, query vectors. And then you can do whatever you want on the, on the front end, right? So for example, one use case could be you have stored queries, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to like see what uh, new data items are going to be hit by these queries every single day, right? So mm -hmm. for example, for financial industry, this might be very important to stay on top of things. What's happening? Do I need to sell my stock or buy stock or do I need to do nothing? Um, and so, mm -hmm. um, so this basically then, uh, become suitable not only for similarity search, but also for image processing itself. Uh, so I think they're using the same units even in space in some cases, uh, because um, so if you don't have, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm getting beyond <laughs> my knowledge here, <laughs> but like if you have like this complex hardware Mm -hmm. uh, with like CPU and like all these magnetic fields <laughs> involved, mm. like in space, you might get hit by the radiation, which like shines directly on that device. And so it melts or whatever, but like, if you have less of that, so you have, you, you only have memory, you can seal it in, in certain way. And then you don't, you don't need like a cooler <laughs> maybe even like, because you don't have the CPU itself, but of course you do need some cooler, I guess, but whatever. So I, I think they're using mm -hmm. it also in space. So it's kind of like a versatile tech. Uh, but it's also now purposed uh, for vector search. And we were like, 
quite surprised. I don't want to like oversell because I, I don't work for GSI, but mm-hmm. I had the exposure and, and, mm-hmm. and kind of like firsthand experience. Um, and what surprised me is that it goes to like millisecond level and you have indexed like 10 million objects. So if I, if I was using, um, let's say elastic search without scaling, without sharding and indexing 10 million objects, it wouldn't probably go to millisecond. It would probably, I don't know, like it would probably be like tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds, I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. Um, it depends on query, of course. Uh, but like here, I was like super, super surprised. Like it was going like, I don't know, 10 <laughs> milliseconds or something like what? Did it even do anything or did it pre-cache <laughs> everything? But no, it, it did compute from scratch. So that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's mind blowing. And uh, that kind of frontiers of computation thing is so fascinating. It reminded me of this little joke we had where uh, when we decided to name Weaviate Air, Weaviate Air, Eddie and goes, now we can't build airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the true. We, sending the weva satellite over <laughs> but, but yeah so i, I think um yeah that, it's really fascinating i think kind of coming out of the approximate nearest neighbor you know the data structures the vector compression such an interesting topic i feel i feel like this is kind of the most technical aspect of it in my view uh, so so coming up one layer then we would have say how you vectorize the queries generally and you mentioned with the custom hardware how you could have some particular way of batching the queries and you know with the offline query use case uh, but so coming up maybe one more layer and this is sort of the part with the neural search frameworks or maybe i'm gonna get myself in trouble because i think that this kind of stuff should live in weaviate we have well it already kind of does like we have the q a transformers uh library where you can you loosely couple the vector search with then passing it to the you know extractive question answering model we have summarization and this kind of thing. So how do you see that next level of the pipeline where you have the res- search results and now you want to process the search results a little more? So you you might, uh, well, I guess maybe one other little thing, I'm not a little thing that I missed was the in a, the combination of vector search with symbolic filters and, you know, as a meta with how that would work with the A and an index. But so just mm-hmm. to, as a note of for the completeness of the coverage, but so now we have the results and we want to process them with maybe question answering, summarization, uh, and, and, and we'll kind of, if we could start from there and then talk about other things we could do. Yeah, actually, maybe I can take a step back. Um, I, uh, it, when I was working on this blog post f- about neural search frameworks, uh, it took me several months because I didn't see the picture coming together yet um, when I when I got the idea of publishing this. And and just to give examples beyond Gina and um, Haystack, you also have um, managed uh, neural frameworks like Vectara, um, mm-hmm. uh, also Relevance AI. Um, but but and and muse, but I also included Hebia. Um, so and 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 like this is where I my head, you know, my my head was blown away. Like I was like, hold on a second. Like so, we move. We basically, if we are looking at the vector search pyramid, uh, as we step, as we take a step, um, you know, upwards. Basically, we are moving closer to the user, right? So because we <laughs> we don't concern ourselves anymore, we kind of like assume that N N layer is solved to an extent. We can fine tune it, but it's solved. Vector search database is solved because it exists, and I can pick a variety of them. Um, so what what is unsolved, right? So why do we need another layer? Like why can't I just like you know sit down and have all these components in my hands and kind of use it as a Lego building blocks and come up with my app. In principle, I could, right? I could take Mm -hmm. VV8, I could take Quadrant, whatever, and I could then build everything. And VV8 offers a lot of these opportunities, like, um, as you said, like for vectorization inside the database. So I don't even need to worry about that part, right? Um, And then you have these components for summarization and things like that. And things, of course, blend. Uh, mm-hmm. now that we move to neural search framework level. Um, but it, it still was very logical. If you look at, if you take a look at the blog, you will see each card, um, you know, uh, for each of these neural frameworks will have a specific field saying, does it use any existing uh, vector database? Um, 
And if not, what is being used if it's kind of publicly available? And so if you look at, for example, Gina, uh, Gina is using uh, VV8 Quadrant Elasticsearch and Redis, using mm -hmm. as in you can choose one of them, right? Depending on your setting. Mm -hmm. um, Haystack, kind of the same, uh, but they also offer an opportunity to implement directly with FIS. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming back to your earlier point, why you need to choose um, a vector database over um, ANN algorithm is because ANN algorithm might not support the symbolic filters, right? So like mm -hmm. if you take HNSWLib um, uh, you know, off the shelf, it won't support the symbolic filters, right? And the mm -hmm. same goes to FICE. It doesn't support symbolic filters. So it means that you will have to have some external database, maybe SQL database, um, where you will have to do this post-processing step. So after retrieving the nearest neighbors from the semantic perspective nearest to your query, now you need to post-filter them mm. you know, using the metadata filters. But that can actually kill the whole list, right? Mm -hmm. And so you will have to either over-query mm and then hope that after post-filtering, some items will remain, or you'll have to repeat it several times, effectively delaying the response to the user, right? So you don't want to do that. So like, you know, databases like VV8, Quadrant, and so on have the support to do this in place, right? In the same mm -hmm. stage, as they say it. Yeah. So I think this is important, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that that actually did change my perspective a bit because I'm I could see like with the with the doc array having a connection to uh, like a graph database separately from Weavia where you aggregate the things and then those go into the re ranking layer the question answering layer and yeah so I can see that I think but then coming back to our not worry about too much and just yep. your core value if if Weavia can offer that kind of like how hybrid search is now in Weavia and you can have the keyword search and the vector search and that kind of flow into your ranking thing. It is very interesting. Um, so kind of one emerging thing with the neural search frameworks, and it comes back to this idea of looking at different indexes, a graph database, a vector index, uh, the, maybe the face static, and maybe you have some application where your data doesn't change. And so then the face index makes a ton of sense. So, so, you so there are these new things called uh, Lang Chain, where the idea is it's a the search framework is around prompting the ch the chat GB. I think I like to say chat GBT instead of GPT three because GPT three is impressive, but chat GBT is super <laughs> impressive. So I, maybe we could call it GBT three point five or or four or whatever. But <laughs> like so, basically the idea is it, it's like the orchestration layer where you tell the language model. Uh, so like. One way of doing it is this chain of thought prompting where uh, you you get the few shot examples are showing you how to like decompose questions such as to like illuminate the compositionality. Like if you're asking, um, uh, did uh, Thomas Edison use a laptop? <laughs> and so <laughs> so you, you'd want to break the question down first to like, OK, when did Thomas Edison live? When were laptops invented? And then you've taken the two facts. So it, it's like this layer on top that tells the language model, like, here are the different data sources you have access to. Uh, so what do you think about that kind of like, how, how this chat GPT technology will influence uh, the neural search frameworks? And then I and then after that, I want to get into like the generalization to images, audio, g like gene, maybe like other kinds of data types. But I think maybe just sticking with text would be a good way to sort of set the stage for this. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I wanted to still blend also with um, kind of like what the value prop is in this uh, neural frameworks and, and, and maybe uh, as a segue to chat GPT, how chat GPT could change things. So like if we take the example of um, Haystack, mm -hmm. um, so for example, what they allow you to do is that the query comes in, you can have a node and, and the way they model this is they have a DAG type of thing, right? So mm -hmm. they have a directed a cyclic graph. And so they, the query gets classified, let's say with a query classifier, that's one node. And then after this query is classified, uh, it can, depending on the class that is predicted, it can either go to 
dense retriever or it can go to a keyword retriever, right? Um, mm -hmm. Let's say maybe it's based on length or some other features that you know work. So you, you have a boundary in your classifier. And, and then, uh, but maybe in some cases, even it could go to both of these. And then you will have a further node that will read the results from these retrievers and will merge them and then present them in some way uh, using, I don't know, RRF method or some reciprocal rank fusion mm -hmm. or some other method. <clears throat> so, and you can like play with this. You can, you, ha you can have like different nodes do different things. Like um, one node could be, if you classified the query as a question, you could do a question answering. But if it was like a table uh, related, like SQL mm -hmm. table, so you classified it as a SQL compatible <laughs> query. Mm -hmm. So you could go to that node and say, hey, can you also query the table? Um, you can also do like document similarity as new documents come in. So it doesn't need always to be, that doesn't always need to be like on the retriever side. It could be as part of your backend pipeline uh, somewhere where you need to do document similarity and then decide whether or not to even compute an embedding for this document. Maybe it didn't change or maybe it didn't change enough to warrant a new mm -hmm. embedding. And so you might discard it and so on. But you also have these other notes, which we talked about earlier about document extraction process. So you extract things and, um, you know, uh, proceed to to the embedding layer. Uh, mm -hmm. But coming back to your question about Chat GPT, um, I, I had an exposure to it. Of course, I I, I actually uh, well asked it, "Can you name my blog post?" Because I was a little <laughs> stuck there, and uh, mm -hmm. and I grounded it and I said, "Hey, I wrote another blog post uh, about vector databases, and this is how it was called. Not all vector databases are made equal. Maybe you can play in those words or something." But it decided not to use the same sort of words and just gave me neural search frameworks. I had to add comparison. I was like, oh, <laughs> boom, cool. <laughs> you, like, you cannot imagine, like, you can do the work mm -hmm. and then it leads up to the posting and you're like, how should I name it? Then you go to your friends, your wife, and they're like, how should I name my blog post? Like, how do I know? <laughs> so in, in these, like, really strange situations, you can reach out to systems like chat gpt like if i went on uh duck, duck, go or, or being a google or something and i asked the same question i probably wouldn't get an answer i would get a bunch of links and like what should i do with these mm. links like <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so this this distracts me more than it gives me value but in chat G gpt i got an instant answer and i was like i like it i spent maybe mm -hmm. five minutes thinking about it and i liked it and i slapped it on the on the title and that was fine so so i think in some sense, maybe to me, this wasn't even a search experience uh, in this kind of basic definition or sort of uh, the way we used to it uh, definition that, okay, I, I need to type something and then I need to examine links or mm. examine some output, go check the results and then decide myself, like, am I satisfied or not? Uh, in chat GPT, you don't have any URLs coming back to you. M not yet, at least. Maybe they will be added. Who knows? But like today, it's more like a companion that you can talk to. And in some sense, I was dreaming of such a companion. Maybe, you know, when you study, you have all these books and papers and everything. But can you really quickly make mm -hmm. sense of, or can you, can you like find an answer to that specific, you know, nagging question like you, you had? during the lecture, uh, it's super hard, right? So you, of course you can go to search engine and start typing all these queries, but here you can have like, um, kind of like a sensible discussion in a way. Mm -hmm. Of course, I know some people uh, were even like hysterically laughing at the results and so on and so forth. So maybe it's not uh, purposed for all situations and also for all audiences. It was actually a discovery for me uh, there was one linguist uh, that I was following. He said that um, he cannot use general web search engines because every time he types something, they don't understand what he. <laughs> they don't have the data. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's not even about understanding. Mm -hmm. it. They don't have the data, and mm -hmm. so he needs to go to libraries and like read books that are not indexed in these search engines and mm -hmm. things like that. So for these very specific niche use cases, maybe. Uh, chat GPT might not work. It depends on the data again. Um, 
but I think it was surprisingly clever, right? Mm -hmm. If I can say so about AI, um, uh, it wasn't always static and you, you explained it well that it takes different paths in the tree when it computes the answer. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the other question I asked, like, can you find a bug in this code that I wrote and it just leaks memory at some point and it, it gave some sensible suggestions and, and I felt like. I know that it's kind of like a silicon there, <laughs> but, <laughs> but and like I cannot maybe like, yeah. um, like I, I still need to examine some caution and sort of not fully trust um, maybe for life sensitive situations or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, or medicine or insurance or something like that. But like things that I know it has indexed and, 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 um, humans have written that, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and uh, it has been sort of vetted multiple times. And so also I've voted a bunch of times on Stack Overflow if you were talking about coding. And so mm -hmm. there are some, there is some evidence that this might be the answer. Um, mm -hmm. But, it, but I think it was still surprising that how it changes the perception of search, even if we can talk about search in this case, that it, it, it actually generates the answer. You know, mm -hmm. search engines don't generate answers today, like beyond maybe, okay, you.com and Google, the you.com, I think is more advanced than this, but like Google has these snippets, you know, where it says, you know, probably mm -hmm. the answer is this. Um, and so they commingle it with URLs. Uh, but like in chat GPT, you don't have any URLs. It just talks to you mm -hmm. and then you can continue the discussion. I don't know. It, it was fascinating, yeah. but I still don't know if, if this will make it into the um, necessarily search experience. Like, mm. so in search, I I think it's very functional. You know, if I walk down the street and I see something on uh, like on the shop window, I take a picture and I say, I want this. Um, and so it finds by the image. Um, so that, that that is still a search experience for me. So in some sense, maybe in the future, you know, we will have control F on everything in the world. Right. Mm. So like as I walk everywhere, um, I can kind of mentally press that control F maybe in some device, <laughs> maybe on top of me, or like as mm -hmm. glasses or something, I don't know, uh, VR. Uh, but like today, a lot of places miss this and, and still there are a lot of contexts and situations when you ask yourself, what is this? Do I know this? You know? Mm -hmm. And you have some other like uh, subsequent questions, but there is no way to ask them because you don't like you pull <laughs> up the phone and start typing and it's freezing weather and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> it's like not, it's kind of like mm -hmm. a deteriorating experience, but I think mm -hmm. it could be so much more um, interactive and multimodal. And I think neural search uh, especially enables multimodality mm -hmm. situations, right? And experiences so that you can actually like, not constrain yourself to to the point that am I uh, asking like a textual mm. query or I, I just have a query. I, I have something on my mind, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe I saw something. Can you tell me more about it? Um, so I think I think maybe Chat GPT might push us in that direction that not only it will find things, but it will also reason about things mm. and help you reason. But, but the creativity part, I don't think it will, it will disappear. I, I don't think, at least not now, I don't, I don't mm. see how AI can solve creativity part, like create things for you. Yeah, it did create the title, mm. um, you know, but, but maybe a more creative person than me could actually create a better <laughs> title, right? And mm -hmm. things like that. So, yeah. It, yeah, th th there's a lot that I want to unpack. And I, I do think this, the creativity is kind of like a characteristic of compositional generalization and novel suppose. But I, I want to just kind of tell you about one other idea that relates to how you had ChatGPT uh, come up with the title for your blog post. And so I want to credit uh, Bob Van Light and Jerry Liu, the creator of GBT Index. They included me on this call where uh, they were, you know, hashing out their understanding of the GBT Index top level indexing. And I just think this idea is so profound on how we use G ChatGPT. And it's the idea of 
when we search and we get like 15 results, as you mentioned, we need to like parse through the result. And, and so like one thinking was like, how about we use a crossing, like a high capacity cross encoder, which is like going to be another like, let's say it'd be like maybe like an 80 million parameter transformer. They There are papers where they use like big T5 models, like billion parameter T5 models to re-rank. And it, there's like this paper where you have the density on yes, or like query, and then you put the query document, document, and then yes, no, and you re-rank with that and you use high capacity models, similar log prop, that kind of idea. But so this idea of like, how do we parse through a bunch of results? And then another idea was like, okay, well, maybe we use a question answering model and we'll re-rank it based on the confidence of the extractive question answering model. And we'll try to calibrate the question answering model to, to demonstrate uncertainty, maybe Bayesian networks, something like that. But this new idea of having GPT summarize the results by having the original question and then saying, please summarize these results, you'll receive it one by one. And then it receives it one by one, updates its summary, Maybe as you mentioned, like you would want to have the reference. It could maybe say like, oh, and also please like, you know, keep a queue of the most influential uh, results as you've been parsing through it. And it's like ability to reason and do this. I've been playing around with this a little bit. I think is just super profound. And that so that kind of summarization across results. What do you think of that idea? Because I just am mind blown by it. Yeah, this this is amazing. Um, I'm not as deep in this topic yet, but just on the surface of it, listening to what you just explained, <clears throat> you know, there is still this trust component as well. That, um, and again, this trust is just how we perceive it. It was designed that way, and we think this is the trustworthy way to uh, vet the information that I'm getting. So if I get the URL from the search engine, I can click it and see it with my own eyes and see when it was published by whom, and maybe I can even mm -hmm. reach out to that person and s ask some questions. Um, so if I'm not provided with this information and evidence, how do I know that this is true, right? So, mm -hmm. um, or maybe does it even apply to my specific situation? Uh, maybe it gave me way too generic answer. And so I think um, it would be interesting to see if if I have a list of people that I follow on Twitter, let's say, and I trust them on specific topic, you know, let's say the way I trust how you, Connor, publish, you know, things about specific papers or mm -hmm. some breakthroughs and recent implementation in vector search space. Um, so when I have a specific question, maybe I could say, hey, let me first check what Connor thinks about this, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so if chat GPT could kind of like bias the answer and include some of the hints from you, from your timeline, not, not from your timeline, but from the things that you publish on Twitter um, on that specific topic, um, and then include that as a supplementary material and maybe like a chapter sort of, you know, mm -hmm. in the answer. So I can, I don't need to, um, you know, go and check Twitter now. I, I can actually go directly to the information, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Bare bone and I can read it. Um, and then if I have a question, maybe if I reach out to you, I might ask a very specific question rather than saying, saying like can you point me to a paper you know um in this topic so so i think if i think um maybe chat gpt made that first important step mm -hmm. uh it created also a lot of like maybe controversy or some people uh i remember like one case on on stack or um on uh, hacker news was uh so this guy's parking his car in in wrong i guess in the wrong lot or like in the wrong spot in the in the parking lot <laughs> and then he gets a fine uh and then he's like out of options and he's thinking okay what if chat gpt can help me here and so he asked chat gpt to write an email to this official uh you know saying <laughs> you know yeah i put on my app and i paid for it but apparently I, pay, I I put my car in the wrong, um, you know, slot mm -hmm. and uh, spot. And so, <laughs> and so it was like, like, in, you know, like how in certain cases, certain situations, like we, 
when we zoom in on a situation and we are a little bit like stressed, we lose words and phrases. Uh, and that's probably why psychologists and consultants exist because you run towards them and you say, Hey, I have a problem. And they will <laughs> oh, calm down, you know, what happened? And then they will help you to walk through the situation. And then they will say, say like this, uh, mm. you know, dear official, whatever, I happened to park my car in the <laughs> wrong spot. I understand this is a big mistake. Uh, however, I paid for it in my app. Here is the receipt. Do you think? You, and then, like, you know, and it's like the computers, they don't. Um, I think this is also a good thing. Like, to some people, it's a bad thing. And it can be, um, I guess, uh, developed towards that. They don't feel, <laughs> they don't have emo emotions, right? <laughs> they may pretend to have emotions, like in yeah. Ex Machina movie, right? But, like, mm -hmm. but I think. Um, they are very calm and like, okay, your problem is this, you know, like Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> okay, here's yeah. the answer. Uh, and, and sometimes it may help you. And actually in that case, the official came back and said, yeah, I understood the situation it happens sometimes, you know, I will just issue a warning this time. <laughs> you don't need to pay fine and <laughs> you are good. Don't do it next time. That's fine. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> I probably I got carried away a bit, <laughs> but, but I think, but I think that coming back to your question, like if I can, if I know that there is a very interesting book or blog post, uh, and it's in my browser history, it's accessible and I can give access to it, uh, to chat GPT, it can go and personalize to my interest however mm -hmm. biased it is i don't mm -hmm. care maybe i do want to be biased i don't mm -hmm. want mm -hmm. a random blog post published somewhere uh, well you can add it if you want but still can you bias to what i have read and i have already forgotten you know in, mm -hmm. in the several <laughs> decades that i leave i've forgotten that i read that book. can you remind me of that <laughs> uh, so yeah i think there is a way to T take chat GPT to the next level in, in terms of personalizing the answers. Yeah. And I think, well, personalizing the answers, I think it come, well, uh, coming to our other podcast where we talked about ref to vec and the personalization vector and how that can filter the search results. And then those are the results that go into chat GPT as context. But I think the other thing you're saying one, I think like this prompting is so interesting. Like one thing I've played with is Write a write an argument between Ilya Sutskever, CEO of, or, or I don't know what his job title is at OpenAI, but uh, write an argument between Ilya Sutskever and Clement Delang from Hugging Face about closed versus open source models, right? Like you prompt it like that, <laughs> you give it like a background about each of them and the argument. And I think also what you say about polite writing, like one of my favorite ways to use ChatGPT is uh, I'm writing something, I give it a sentence, and I say, "Could you suggest seven writings of this?" And it's funny you mentioned that it's just silicon because sometimes I'm like. I'm like, oh, seven, that's kind of a tall task, <laughs> maybe just three. You know? <laughs> like, but, and I, I think that kind of comes into also like when it's no longer free, it might change how we use it a little bit too. Like the, like the way I use the GPT-3 API, I'm like, well, I'm paying for the tokens generated. So <laughs> let me not prompt it to give some long generation. But so I think this has been a great coverage of ChatGPT. And I it, continuing on the pyramid, I kind of want to hit what I see at the top level, which is just the user interface, like the, you know, like, someone with CSS skills, how they contribute and how they fit into this. And I've, I've seen uh, like Gina now, uh, you know, I know we have some stuff that it's not out yet, but like on this kind of the search interface. And I know like, usually, you know, you just have like the search box, right? Like it's just the bar is like kind of the interface, but say you're doing like image search and you want to like click on the images, you want to fuse that with the search box. And I don't know, do you see like a lot of, and I know like you.com, and it kind of comes into what you're saying with how you have the evidence as well. Like you.com, they have this interface where they split the search results and then the uh, chat GPT, like this interface. Do you think there's opportunity for innovation at that layer? Yeah, uh, I think one one part is innovation. And another thing that I've been thinking about is, let's say if there is a existing player and they have a search engine or recommend recommender system or something and they're thinking okay can we uh, experiment with vector search but we're probably not like 100 percent sure yet is it going f to fly or mm -hmm. you know 
can we expose it only to sort of like the power users in some sense? Uh, I think Genome had this kind of like um, early stage demos in some sense, early stages in maybe you don't go with this in, into production, but it helps you to reason about um, and, and test um, what's more important, I think, um, the influence of neural search on your, um, you know, search engine experience. So they had, um, I think they had this search engine where like a demo where you type a query um, and then you have this um, slider, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So you can say, you know, have more weight, put more weight on keyword results and then you mm -hmm. slowly blend this into the neural search and then and then you can choose like, okay, it's going to search directly in the images, let's say using clip model, um, but still combine the results. So still ask the keyword retriever um, and then combine the results from the dense retriever from the clip model and sort of like show me where these results land, right? So if, because for some queries, it doesn't make sense to check the image because it's succinct enough and it looks like it's going to match a specific metadata, you know, item um, filter or maybe title of that object. So there is no reason really to go and examine the image because it doesn't contain this information and vice versa too. Like in some cases when I say, I don't know, like, uh, can you give me a picture of a bear eating a fish in the <laughs> river? You know, there is no such title, but you do, do have an image of a bear eating the fish in the river and you're like, mm. yeah, maybe if the model, and we have mm. done this in the clip search um, engine mm. uh, demo that uh, essentially it, it surprises you, blows your mind that the clip model can, um, summarize its understanding, so to say, to this level that it, it will match anything you type like that. So you say a bear and it understands what the bear is. It's not an otter and things like that, right? So this is very interesting. And of course it goes back to, you know, contrastive learning and you can have enough of uh, negative examples, which are semantically negative and not just random negative examples and things like that. Um, but I also uh, came across, I wonder if I can pull it up, um, but I, when I published this blog post about neural um, search um, uh, frameworks, um, uh, I came across uh, this company called Nuclea. So I didn't, mm. didn't yet include them in the blog post. I need to study this a little more. Uh, but there was some interesting thing that they offer um, a way to compose the UI as well, right? So it's not only, this is coming back to your question, you know, can we uh, sort of make some break, breakthroughs there? Of course, if it's an established player, they have the dedicated front-end team, they will probably figure out what they want to do and they mm -hmm. have an existing product. But if you are on the verge of experimenting, right? So you're still <laughs> there, you, you have your, your like mind open, in many ways, you, you, you don't know what UI will be in the end. Uh, they offer beyond, you know, um, a database, font structured data. They all also offer you a number of components on the front end side. So you can basically compose the UI the way you want. Hmm. Um, and I think like you.com, I think you mentioned also experiments with chat GPT like answers, right? So mm -hmm. not only the URLs, but also kind of like an answer which is more interactive and maybe you can continue the discussion there mm -hmm. in that box. Um, I also wanna like um, give an example which, which, which was like pre-neural search uh, era in many ways uh, at alpha sense, like, like when I look at document search engines, you know, let's say it's an article search engine or patent search engine, uh, usually you will have like um, several stages as you go through the uh, UI as a workflow. So first you need to type the query, mm -hmm. then the screen changes to the list of documents, sort it in some way, then you click on the document again, the screen changes and it opens the document, right? Uh, what AlphaSense did really, really early on, like 2010, um, was to have what we called a three pane UI. Mm -hmm. So you have like 
you have a search bo box at the top. Uh, you type the query, press enter, you get a uh, vertical uh, column, mm -hmm. you know, a column with the results. Not too narrow. You can still figure out what is what. Uh, you can read titles. You click on that. Uh, it gets the snippet pane. Uh, so you can actually quickly gather, okay, is this relevant to me or not? Mm -hmm. So you have like several stages, but it's all on the same screen, almost like an Amazon uh, checkout page, right? Kind mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as you click on the snippet, it pulls up the document, however big it is, maybe let's say a PDF document, thousand pages, it will load only the necessary chunk of that document and it mm -hmm. will jump from that clicked snippet to the relevant uh, section of the document. So now you basically have all these, you know, tools mm -hmm. in the same view. And I think uh, this is very powerful because it saves a ton of time, you know, because you, you, you need to always kind of walk the, in the shoes of the user. What mm -hmm. does the user want to achieve with your, uh, not with your product, they hire your product uh, to get some job done, right? Mm -hmm. And so is your UI efficient enough uh, in, in, in uh, you know, in satisfying that uh, specific uh, request? And so, so I think this was very interesting. And, and then some competitors tried, not only tried, but copied, you know, this, <laughs> this view and, and then the history goes on. But, but, but I think this was a very interesting breakthrough, even like before uh, neural search. But with neural search, a lot more doors open because, and also it brings that complexity layer that now product managers, engineers got to simplify. So mm -hmm. like you need to simplify the complex always uh, because the users will not have time to figure out really complicated uh, designs or UIs, however flashy flashy your UI is, if it's not functional, it's going it's not going to fly. And so you need to kind of like simplify the complex. And now these open doors with multimodality, right? So like all of a sudden your query can go directly into inside the image. Now it pulls up the mm -hmm. image. You need to explain to the, you, you cannot highlight like a snippet inside <laughs> the image, right? And say, hey, there is an arrow here. That's the bear you will you were asking for. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or like inside the patent, like in patent search, I spent some time, uh, I was part of the board in one um, big enterprise, basically uh, examining the patent uh, to be the patent applications and, <laughs> a big chunk of work for a patent presenter would go into examining the prior art. Mm -hmm. And so they need to examine a ton of patents and figure out whether or not they overlap with that specific button or not. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this means that the search, um, the search workflow changes from get me something on the screen and I'll decide if it's good enough to can you give me everything there is on this topic? So it's mm -hmm. like a long, long search. You paginate like mm -hmm. hell until like 200, page 200 or something. And mm -hmm. you gotta have like 100 results on the per page or something like that. So they spend like days mm -hmm. examining just one query. And then you go, mm -hmm. go back and say, oh, my query is missing this mm -hmm. term. You know, let me change my query. Boom! I have again the new <laughs> list of results, and now yeah. it would be cool if the system showed me the difference, right? Mm -hmm. And this was another feature we had at AlphaSense. You know, as new documents come in, let's say you have a, uh, uh, let's say if it's a public company and they publish um, a 10K report, which is like a yearly SEC filing. Um, it might include portions of a quarterly report from a quarter prior. Mm -hmm. And so, and also like that 10K, which was published a year ago, they don't actually rewrite it. They just <laughs> change some numbers, right? You know, like <laughs> our performance, our top line, whatever. <laughs> so like you don't want to reread 700 pages again to learn, has <laughs> something changed with this company? You just <laughs> want to see, oh, the top line changed and also, <laughs> 
you know they spend a lot more on production of that sort and like okay now i need to go back to my excel and input these numbers and see what happens to the stock price prediction right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i mean always think i don't know if i answer your question well mm -hmm, enough mm -hmm. uh, but like always like forget about vector search forget about learning to rank you know <laughs> however sexy those are and those are super cool i mean i'm excited myself always go back to what user wants right mm -hmm. like if they're driving to that destination as we compute in tom tom always remember i'm sitting in the car it's freezing it's dark i want to get there <laughs> you know? so so show me that top result mm -hmm. as soon as possible so i don't need to type that long you know uh sitting in that free freezing weather or whatever <laughs> so <laughs> so so it's not i think it's a good exercise to mm -hmm. always kind of go back and maybe talk to the users as well mm -hmm. um in some cases, it's more uh, maybe complex, but I think still that pipeline could be established and you can start asking questions. Okay, what are you trying to find? What is your normal sort of workflow and use case? What are you trying to optimize for? And they will give you very interesting, sometimes confusing answers maybe. So you can drill in and find a, sort of a more detailed version of what they wanted to say. Um, but then it comes to the rolls up to this bigger picture. Aha, I got it. Uh, we are just missing one button here, <laughs> something like yeah. that. And then, yeah, um, Bob had taught me about this jobs to be done framework for thinking about this. And, and I think at the use and the jobs to be done, it's like this business school thing about like, why did you hire the donut to do the job of, uh, something to eat on the way to work. <laughs> like, I think of the user interface layer, you think the most about the job being done. So I think that was a great, and, and yeah, the job to be done has cascading effects to the whole pyramid and, <clears throat> and the different requirements all the way down. I think this is a great uh, summary of the pyramid and then a transition into a really fun topic to wrap up with, which is um, this idea of renaming vector search to maybe relevance application. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I actually wanted to pick your brain on that because I know you, the moment I posted uh, that podcast <laughs> with uh, uh, Yaev, uh, you have uh, responded and, and that was like a long answer. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I got Connor and he's like really <laughs> passionate about this topic. I think this is important. Like I, I will... I will tell this disclaimer, it's not my idea, but I like to throw in some thoughts which are of higher level. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the goal is to not change the course of the industry, but more like inform and give another perspective. And I think this mm -hmm. perspective came from Doug Turnbull on, on, on one of the episodes, in one of the episodes of Vector Podcast, where he said, if I was to give an advice today to the vector search engines, to the vector databases, I would say, stop calling yourself a vector database. <laughs> and it was like a cold shower already, like call, <laughs> stop calling yourself a vector database and call ourselves what and why. <laughs> Uh, but he spent a lot of time in search, right? Mm -hmm. He wrote a book, Relevant Search as well, co-wrote it. Um, and he's uh, co-writing AI-powered search as well. And so as he said, well, think about the nutshell of what you're building, right? It's so like what um, new area you are discovering, right? You, on, on one hand, we are all building or participating in, in the construction sort of like uh, rise of new, new industry, but in the end of the day, it either solves or doesn't solve some <laughs> use case or plethora of use cases, right? So we claim that we are moving to semantic search level, right? Something that didn't happen before, something that was hard to achieve and, you know, maybe with custom synonyms, uh, synonym tables or with bootstrapping another shard to handle that language. Now we have multilingual models, mm -hmm. so they handle um, multiple languages in the same representation. And so it's the same shared geometric space, which is kind of like super cool. I can, mm -hmm. ans I can ask my 
my question in one language and get it searched in another language, then you still need to deal with the answers. Like, do I need to translate them back to the source language or something? But that's another story. Um, and so, so he claimed, or he kind of like suggested that in a way we are solving towards uh, relevancy. And so he said, why don't you call yourself a relevance oriented application? And he wasn't stubborn on that specific term or like that specific <laughs> phrase, but I guess the key word for me that stood out is relevance, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, because, and then I, I also weared my hat of a product manager and thought, okay, if I go to my boss at TomTom Tom and I say, hey, let's um, bring this semantics into the mix um, and guess what? We need a vector database. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's acquire a vector database license or something. Mm -hmm. I think the first question will be, what the heck is a vector database? <laughs> is it like vector clocks? I used to have some cores or something. No, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just joking here, but I'm saying that, you know, or like it, it becomes like this kind of uh, engineering uh, lingo um, or like they say Greek, right? So speak <laughs> English. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then you say, oh, you know, vector databases, it's like a new breed of databases. Um, it's like the next stage sequel. I'm like, sequel? Uh, oh, <laughs> wait a sec. I'll just forget all this. It's, it's, um, it's basically like moving everything, using deep learning, moving <laughs> everything to deep learning. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, hold on. Um, so semantics, you get the word semantics, right? <laughs> so like we yeah. move to semantic uh, level searching. And um, by the way, we can ask uh, natural language questions now. Oh, natural language questions, what is that? <laughs> so it's like, well, just, just normal questions. Instead yeah. of typing keywords, you can basically, you see what I'm doing? I'm <laughs> basically like stepping back and back and back and I'm kind of like degrading mm the terminology from oh this is like a super cool aircraft uh, <laughs> you know and i've used yeah. all these materials to build it all, yeah. all these glowing buttons but like what can it do <laughs> it can fly you to mars <laughs> mars i don't i don't want to go to mars <laughs> you see what i'm saying like mm -hmm. like step back as far as possible back mm -hmm. and say you know you remember we have this problem in 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 TomTom. Tom, sometimes people ask questions, so they say, "Can you drive me to a lake or something?" <laughs> so it's like they don't type like an address because they don't know the address of the lake. Lake mm -hmm. doesn't have an address. Maybe it has the coordinates. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have certain percent of these queries, and maybe we can tackle them with this new tag. Um, mm -hmm. Then you can maybe say vector databases are the new breed of databases, but like, yeah, I guess when you when you enter a discussion with an uh, prepared customer, uh, you might not start. Maybe it's not a good idea to start with vector database or some technical mm -hmm. term. Instead, you know, talk about semantics or relevance or something like of that sort. Yeah, let me see if I can do. Uh, can you drive me to the lake? I think maybe let's see if that example can show the different intents that that could entail. So, so maybe you would want to be asking it like, "Are you capable of this task?" And it would say like, "Yes, I could show you how to drive to the lake." Maybe it would say, maybe it would find another question where someone else had asked something like that. Or, you know, what you want probably is like the Google Maps directions, current location to the nearest lake. Like, so I've been seeing this like intent ranking papers like task aware retrieval with instructions and the instructor model where, uh, yeah, like there's different intents for different search tasks. Like, so with Cora duplicate question detection, like the academic data set, you're looking for another question, not the answer to the question. And, and so it's, I don't know too many cases, like it's kind of like the idea where you encode the domain in the task. Like you, you'd say, search me a paragraph in scientific literature compared to in Reddit. Like it could have like, find me a, you can say like, find me a conversation on Reddit, which is a different d intent than um, find me the answer from Wikipedia. Is this helping? <laughs> like this kind of 
so I don't, so that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. I mean, I still think, I, I still think the vector search database, I like that so much because it, it kind of comes all the way back to the pyramid where it's like this coupling of the ANN and then the database stuff. And just maybe it's particularly to how it's done in WeVA, but that those two are so tightly coupled sort of, I see it as that that's sort of like what I see as the novelty, but yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. I, I think relevance podcast, uh, welcome to yeah. season three of the welcome uh, relevance. Podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually I was, I was, I was surprised or maybe, um, it confirmed the bias in a way that when I was writing this blog post about neural search frameworks, one of the players is called relevance AI. Mm. And when I was talking to Daniel Vasilev, who is the CEO of this company and co-founder, um, he was advising me to even stop using the word vector and embedding. And I was like, mm. what do you mean? And he was saying, well, you know, our user base and our target user base is not necessarily engineers, it's not necessarily deep learning researchers. It's mm -hmm. um, anybody. It's mm -hmm. uh, someone working in HR and they have a bunch of CVs and I guess they want to like take a look at them from a different angle, quickly find a candidate, maybe plot some characteristics, you know, quickly cluster them, things like that. And so, mm -hmm. And so they don't, um, they don't, uh, you know, so the progression of thought is not like this. I have a bunch of CVs. <laughs> what I'll do, I embed them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then based on the embeddings, I will compute the clusters and then I will run vector search. No, they, they don't even know what these things are. They go on relevance AI platform, they upload uh, CVs or they point to some archive or like cloud URL and then the system pulls them down and basically extracts all of these things that we described in this in this uh, episode, you know, with the workflows, it does it behind the scenes, so you don't need to worry about it. And then it embeds the, uh, the documents and then it basically gives you the search prompt so you can search them, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so they, they target, I guess, a completely different, um, user base right so like if you if you if you contrast that to for example what haystack is doing and i was also talking with malta a lot mm -hmm. uh, as i was prepping the blog post um he was saying that this is kind of like a development kind of like an id in a way right so like um deep set cloud is kind of like an id for mm -hmm. integrated development environment for um a, an engineer or researcher or maybe both of them collaborating uh, and they can even chat uh, so you can find references of, of the discussion that happened earlier and like go through that and things like that and make decisions together and then plot metrics. So it's a different, it's a different like user base, right? Like, mm -hmm. like the target user, ideal user is somebody who like understands coding and understands the concerns of scaling and cost management and whatnot. And so they are much closer to the actual uh, platform creation, right? Mm -hmm. So, but like, if you're top, like someone reached out recently to me on LinkedIn uh, in product management capacity, and they said, yeah, we know that you published all of this, but can you give us like a couple blog posts mm -hmm. um, or maybe a podcast, which introduces us to this space? So I, I, I don't think I will send them like haystack URL, mm. right? Like, because it will be way too technical for them. And, and haystack has like excellent documentation, but it's purposed to engineers and researchers in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then of course there is, and, and there is a product for every of these um, choice mm -hmm. or sort of business model, right? So like, mm -hmm a product to be created. So for in, in, in the case of Haystack, they have deep set cloud, so you can basically subscribe, pay for it and don't need to host and like worry about how I scale, if something breaks, whatever, right? Same with VV8, you know, you, you guys have a cloud as well, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so, so I guess to wrap up this thought is that it kind of like depends on what your ideal target user is, right? Um, 
and also what um, use cases you have uh, tested your tech with. You know that another use case like this, we know mm -hmm. how to how to work through it, and so that's why in each card in the blog post you will also find use cases mm -hmm. um, list, right? And and I tried to focus not on if I could not only on sort of tech level or kind of like algorithm level thing, but actually specifically on the end user facing use case. For example, in the case of Haystack, they have, you know, document information extraction, but they also mm -hmm. have, um, you know, getting revenue numbers from a financial report. Mm -hmm. This sounds mm -hmm. more like a specific use case now, right? Or like reason for a legal claim. <laughs> So it's not it's not it's not like um okay I have this neural network <laughs> how do I plug in that into quadrant of VV8 to pinecone right mm -hmm. or Vespa <laughs> um, is there a plugin architecture that I can implement you know what I mean like mm -hmm. so it's it's a, it's a different level of abstraction and it's a different level of discussion as well and mm -hmm. so so I think when Doug I believe <laughs> kind of like deciphering his thought process was to kind of stop talking only, maybe only about tech. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I, by the way, I love vector database myself, that term. My mm -hmm. podcast is vector podcast. Many people think it's about vector search, but it's not only vector search. It's mm -hmm. also like I, in the, in the about um, on YouTube, I actually mm -hmm. write that it's like a vector as in, what vector you have in your profession and life, in a way. <laughs> yeah. right? so, so, but many people come back and say, Dmitry Khan, the creator of Vector Search Podcast. Oh, damn, it's not Vector Search Podcast, it's just Vector Podcast. But, but, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's I like okay, the sound of too. Yeah. <laughs> like Vector Podcast, very cool. So, so I guess to wrap up again, uh, really close on, off on this, that... Um, so first of all, a it's it's about the niche. It's it's the not the niche, but sort of like your ideal user that you are going after. Mm -hmm. And b think about are you limiting yourself unnecessarily mm -hmm. in the way of sort of how many users, what type of user you could reach with your um, with your mm -hmm. system, with your engine, b because as you said. For example, VV8 could, in principle, eat away some functionality from neural search frameworks. So it kind of like begins to occupy these two layers in this vector search pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. um, or blend them, and that's why, and that's fine. But like, is it is it limiting too limiting to say that it's only a database mm -hmm. and it's only a vector database? Maybe it's more than that, right? So that's just a couple thoughts there. Yeah, it's really enlightening. And I, I want to give credit to Sebastian Wittelek and the DevRel team at WeV8 that's helping me think like this. Like, um, I guess, like me personally, I have a background in like doing academic research in the PhD and, you know, reading machine learning papers and thinking very along the lines of like vector search database makes a ton of sense. Right. But like, um, like I think one example is um, Erica Cardenas on the WeV8 team. Also, she created a, a like a dog image search demo and so it's like there could there are like layers to how you want to present this you could it could be like just point us to a, a folder with images in it right that was like the, the most simple thing to do or it could be like okay well we're going to actually encode this into a base 64 encoding we're going you know, like, to use a resnet we're going to use the resnet 18 is you know, probably yeah. don't need the 32. <laughs> you know, like, so it's like, how much detail do you want to cover? And I think it's super interesting. And, and, and like by communicating that way, you'll unlock the like creativity of the people who are thinking at, at the higher application layer and, you know, paying the bills the other way is because <laughs> I wonder how many times we've said that phrase <laughs> in the hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's like decision makers, right? Sometimes you... Mm -hmm. Sometimes it actually is going the opposite way. It's like um, you may spare some time as an engineer or researcher, uh, test some algorithm, show result, impress yourself, impress mm -hmm. your colleagues, and then this rumor will travel 
to the level of product management decision making above product management as well. And they will say, wow, this is super cool. Can mm-hmm. we release this to prod now? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, does it happen frequently? I don't know. It depends on the company, I guess. It depends on the culture. And I guess we could also spend some time talking at some point, you know, how companies are structured and how you have this, uh, I think it's Conway Law, right? So <laughs> that um, your product is a result of how you have uh, organized people in the company. Mm -hmm. Because they will have like teams, silos, maybe at some point even, and some teams might not be talking to each other as much as you think they could. And so your product will be, a product architecture will be a result of this information architecture, which Mm -hmm. is also very interesting. Um, But for startups, it's probably not the problem. Uh, for startups, you can talk to anybody anytime <laughs> in principle, <laughs> right? But you yeah. still need to get job done. So that's mm-hmm. that's also another perspective. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, this is a very interesting topic. And in general, um, a lot of angles to take. And um, if you always like remember whom are you talking to and and just to wrap up on that thought like if the if the breakthrough doesn't happen from the engineering level can it happen let's say and product management level because you have resonated with how they think Mm -hmm. and you know what type of issues they're trying to solve and you have stepped back from the technical terminology and you started talking their lingo and they said, here is what vector search actually is. And and then they will <laughs> yeah. know, go back to the, the drawing board and say, ah, this is what it enables mm-hmm. us to do. And mm-hmm. now we can search inside the images. Wow, <laughs> that's super cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, amazing. I think this was an amazing podcast, beginning from talking about the opportunity cost of bad search and retail and then taking it into, okay, so you're building a neural search framework. There's all these components to it, your famous pyramid diagram and walking through every step in detail, then coming to (laughs) thoughts on chat GBT. Yeah. And I think just the user interface, the jobs to be done, this whole thing and the renaming of vector search has been such an incredible podcast. Uh, Dimitri, thank you so much for your time coming on the WeVA podcast. And thanks also so much for hosting me on the vector podcast. I'm such a fan of the vector podcast and what you're doing. It's so, it's so interesting to hear all the different characters. And I think sort of the role you're playing and being like the mediator of the market this way and hearing all the diverse voices, hopefully I didn't give up too much of what we're thinking, but (laughs) this kind of diversity of hearing what everyone's thinking, it's just so fascinating. And, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Connor, for hosting uh, me. And uh, this was an amazing time. Always uh, glad to and happy to exchange with you all these thoughts and uh, almost like in the brainstorming fashion. Yeah. And I'm excited for the future of this with ChatGPT and uh, all the breakthroughs that you guys are working on and, and, and many players on the market as well. Thank you.